Calvary, Lord, the, the grace that, Lord, that you're pouring out right now, Father, that we can open up our hands and receive today. That, God, your grace is not just a little, but it's abundant. And your grace is being poured out upon us right now. Your grace is being poured out over every need, Father, today, right now. Every need, Father. It says that you shall supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. Everything, Father, whether it's spiritual, physical, financial, emotional, God, whatever, Lord. Thank you today that your grace is greater, God. And your grace is empowering us, Father, to be a people that live for you and for your honor and for your glory, God. Oh, we give you praise. We give you thanks, Lord. God is so good. Amen. Wow. We've been asking the Lord to help us to create, you know, a space for him to just come so that we can meet with him. Amen. And uh, so I hope you've been meeting with him all week long. Amen. I hope you've been spending time with him all week long because that's the that's the blessing of it, it all is that we don't get to just gather on on a Sunday and worship and praise Him and read His Word, and but we get to scatter into our world and know that He is with us, that He goes with us everywhere we go. Uh, well, the challenge of deeper waters, and so I, I just really think that God is really going to help us today. Something that's been um, uh, been just weighing on my heart, just a, a little. Um, quote that I, I read the other day. I don't even remember who, who said it or where I read it at. And I may have I may have may have elongated the quote a little bit. I may have made it larger than it really was. But I, I wrote this down because I want to start with this today because I think this is so important for us as his children. Amen. Are you a child of God today? Are you glad that you're a child of God a God? Amen that you're his child. And so Quote goes kind of like this. It says, the little decisions that you make, the little steps of obedience that you take every day can bring great breakthrough. I want you to just think about that for a minute. The little decisions, the little decisions that you make, the little steps of obedience that you take every day can bring great breakthrough. And I think that as we look... At, at uh, Luke chapter 5, and we see this encounter that Jesus has with Peter, we're going to see actually Peter begin to live out that actual quote, that little decisions that you make, the little steps of obedience that you take, every day can bring great breakthrough. As a matter of fact, every great revival happens because of that. Because in the little and the little and the great things we're being obedient. Think about that this morning. And uh, so we have we have we have uh, Luke chapter five. And uh, now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, so you know everybody has heard about Jesus, and now they're pressing in on him. You know he's the he's the miracle worker. He's the way maker. He's the promise keeper. He's the light in the darkness, amen. And so everybody has heard about his word, and, and Jesus, when he preaches his word, he preaches it with what? Last week we talked about authority. His words had authority. So everybody in chapter 5, the crowds are pressing in on him, and they're listening to the word of God. He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. And, but the fishermen had gotten out of them. And they were what? They were done for the night. They were out all night. They were off. They had already been fishing all night. And they were, and their nets were coming up empty. But so now, what do, what do, they, what do you do if you're, if you're a good fisherman? You clean your nets. Your night is over. Your work is done. You come back empty handed. And now what are you doing? You're cleaning you're cleaning your nets. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And then he got into the boat, of course, Jesus, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. Now, I love this switch of scenes because, you know, we've got, we've got Jesus going to the synagogues and everybody is gathering, right? 
right? They're gathering. And now Jesus is, is moving from the synagogue to the, to, the, to the side of this mountain to share the gospel. And, and all of a sudden, there's this scattering that happens, right? Um, I, I, I thought this was really powerful. So they were, they were gathering in the synagogue. Now, the synagogue went to them. Jesus went to them, he scattered, and he began to share the good news um, that he had. Um, the church, by the way, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, the church is only the church when it exists for others. And, and Jesus knew that what was happening in the synagogue couldn't stay there. He had to go out. He came to proclaim the good news. Amen? Right? That's what he came to do. So we gather, by the way, we gather to come and worship him. We come to, to read God's word. We come to get encouraged. We come to pray. We come to seek him. But then we scatter to proclaim him. And this is exactly what is happening. Peter's boat, by the way, became a place to give out the word of God. Amen? Think about that. All of a sudden... This boat became a platform. It became literally one of these pew, uh, these uh, podiums for him to preach, to proclaim the, the word of God. So a good question, I think, for us as we, as we move forward in this day, as we look at what Peter did, we have to ask ourselves the same question. Are we willing to allow God to use us right where we are? Are we willing... To say yes to God and allow him to use you right where you are. If, if we truly believe that we're not here by accident, that God has not put us here by mistake, that wherever we're living at, wherever our homes are, whatever, wherever we work at, whatever we do, are we willing to allow him to work right where we're at? How could God use our current location to become a place where the word of God can be given out? How can our current location be a, a place where a dialogue can be created? Did you know that there are so many people that are hungry to just talk? A place, think about this. What would happen if in 2023 we decided to say we're going to use our homes to become discipleship centers? That the church no longer is just a place to make disciples, but the, the, our homes can be a place where disciples... Because Jesus knew that, that that boat that day was going to be a place where they were going to literally fish for men. Amen? Amen. To make disciples. But there was another side to this request that, Peter, uh, that Jesus had for Peter. Because Peter was now in the boat, and he was a captive audience, right? And he was listening, it says, to the word of God. And as Peter was listening, by the way, that's so important to develop a listening heart. To be people that are listening to God as we're praying, as we're listening to the word of God. To be people that are listening to the Holy Spirit. But as Peter was listening, God was preparing him for something greater. Amen. Do you believe that God has a plan and purpose for your life? Well, what happens is when you begin to listen to God, when you begin to listen to the Holy Spirit, just as Peter was listening to the Word of God, he will begin to unveil, he will begin to reveal those things about your life and your purpose to you. Amen? You'll get that discernment. So Peter was a captive audience in his boat. He was listening to the, the, to, to the Word of God. And Jesus then would ask Peter to trust him and to move out into deeper waters. Deeper waters. In Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And I think the message puts it pretty well. He says, before you trust, you have to listen. Okay? Turn to someone and say, you have to listen. All right? All right? Y'all got to listen. Amen? Because really, we, we are so distracted. There, there is so much going on around us. We are so uh, captivated by so much. So we've got to figure out how to listen, right? Really, we have to know how, how to listen. But unless, it says, but unless Christ's word is preached, there's nothing to listen to. Amen? Amen. So fill this in. Our faith in Jesus is birthed. Our faith in Jesus is birthed in our hearts as we listen and what? Respond to God's word. As we begin to hear God speak, as Peter began to hear God speak and ask him to press out into deeper waters, and he responded to God's word, that's where this, this whole thing is being birthed. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. says this, faith is taking the first step even when you do not see the whole staircase. 
So many miracles happen when we respond to God's word, when we take small steps of faith. Anybody got your shoes on? Move your feet right now. Just move it out there a little bit, okay? Think about this. You've got to think about this. These small steps of, of faith. And wherever God is calling you to do something, guess what he'll do? He'll always provide everything that's needed to take care of business. I love Philippians 1.6. I remember 22 years ago, I was freaking out. I had never been a pastor before. I had never done any kind of leadership at all. And actually, I was about six months into my journey here as a pastor. And I was, I mean, I was broken. I was, I don't know how to explain it, anxiety. I just uprooted my kids and my family and came here, came back. I love, I love coolidge. But for some reason, something was happening in my heart. And it was probably about six months into the, my journey here. And I thought, you know, I can't do this. I, I just can't do this. I can't. I can't pastor. I've never done this before. This is this is too big. And literally at two o'clock in the morning, I'm trying to find DS Dan. He's our district superintendent. I call I call him up at two o'clock in the morning and I say, Dan, I can't pastor anymore. I can't do this. And he goes, Why? And I go, I don't know. I just can't. There's just too much pressure. And he gave me this scripture, and I have stood on this scripture. For the last 22 years. And it says this. And I am confident. That God. Who began the good work within you. Will continue his work. Until it is finally finished. On the day when Christ Jesus returns. And I want you to know. That if you don't have a scripture for your life. Claim that for your life today. Because whatever God begins. He will complete. Amen. And, and it's not over until Jesus returns. Philippians 4.13 says what? I can do what? All things through who? Through Christ who gives me strength. Isaiah 58.11 says this. Our great God will always guide you where to go and what to do. He will fill you with refreshment even when you are in a dry, difficult place. He will continually restore strength to you so you will flourish like a well-watered garden and like an ever-flowing, trustworthy spring of blessing. So first, Jesus said to, to Peter, thrust out a little. Just get me off the shore because I want to I use your boat for a platform to share the good news. But it wasn't just all about that. When, when, Peter, when Peter was ready, in verse 4, Jesus commanded him, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And so when, when, Peter, when Jesus calls Peter to, to go into deep waters, it represents the new life direction they're about to undertake. Now, so, okay, let's go back to this. The little decisions that you make, the little steps of obedience that you take every day can bring what great breakthrough. And this is what's happening, is that Peter is making little steps of faith, little steps of obedience. Going deeper with God will mean going into deeper waters, okay? Think about that. If you want to go deeper with God, you're going to have to go deeper into deeper waters. And God is going to call you to try. Think about this. In, in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, When you come looking for me, when you seek me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me, when you really search for me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. Yes. See, this is, this is how God is growing Peter's faith, and I, and I truly believe that's how God grows our faith, by being obedient. Amen? By taking steps and trusting Him. So that's the question for you today, is how, how is God trying to, to take you deeper in, his, in your relationship with Him? What are those steps that He's calling you today to trust Him? Anybody have one of those things like in your heart, like, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus,' right? We got, like, you're, is there a place where God is calling you to take a step right today and say, I'm going to trust you. So I don't know where you're at today, but before we move forward, wherever it is, let's bow our heads. Take a moment right now 
And if there's an area that you're not trusting him, say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take that step. I'm going to move out into that deeper water where, where you're at. I may not know what's going to happen in this situation. I may not know how it's going to turn out. But I'm going to trust you. I am going to trust you today. The little decisions, those small steps of obedience you take, that you make each and every day, can bring great breakthrough. And this is what is happening with Peter. If Peter had not obeyed, the first seemingly, by the way, insignificant command put out a little from the shore. This is the first request. Get a little away from the shore. He would never have participated in what? A miracle. Think about that. If he would have never taken that step to go out into deeper water, he could have said, Jesus, I'm tired. I don't want to go out there. I've already been fishing all night. But when Jesus said, go out into the deeper waters, he chose to be obedient and go out there. But if he hadn't gone out there and taken that little step, he would have never seen a miracle. Do you ever wonder what miracles are waiting you today? Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and guess what? He's going to make your path straight. As we recognize Him, as God is calling us to be obedient, to take these steps of faith and join Him in His work, guess what it says? He will make our path straight. But He did not say, by the way, He would make it easy. Anybody want an easy path? We all want an easy path. That's not what he said. He said he would make it straight. But he didn't say it would make it easy. He didn't say, by the way, he would remove obstacles. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say he would make, uh, like for Peter, hey, Peter, this is going to be smooth sailing. No. But he will always make a way. And that is really my prayer for, uh, for CCN and for Coolidge and for our world, that we will know not only in our heads but in our hearts that God is in control. Amen. Turn to someone and say, God is in control. He's in control. I'm telling you, whether you say it or not, it doesn't change the fact that God is in control. And if we allow God to step into our boat, okay, like Peter did, and we will push offshore, if we'll trust God and move out a little bit, God will use this, this small step of faith to launch you out into deeper waters and also discovering his purpose and plans for your life. So now, now this is the thing. Peter's probably surprised. Because Jesus took command of his boat and his crews, right? Literally, this is what's happening. I mean, what's that, what's that called? A mutiny. Right? This is what's happening. I mean, Jesus is literally taking control, taking command of the boat and crew. But think about this. There's always a testing point for the soul. And here's, here's, the, here's the thought. Would Peter surrender the command and let Christ be the captain? And you have to ask yourself today, who's in charge of your boat? Are we the captains of our boats? Or have we surrendered our lives and said, Jesus, I, I want you to take command of my life. I want you to be the one that's in charge. Now, remember back in Luke 4, 22, a few weeks ago, when, when Jesus was going to his hometown, guess what they saw? They didn't see the Son of God, or they didn't see, they saw the Son of Joseph. And I, and I think in some ways right now, Peter is probably doing the same thing in his mind. He said, you know, in his mind, he's going like, as G Jesus asked him to go out into deeper waters and put down his death, I think, I think Peter's probably going, wait, you're a carpenter. You have no idea what to do here. I, I am the, the fisherman. I'm the one with experience. And think about this. Simon and the others must have felt like telling Jesus, hey, you need to stick to building furniture. <laughs> right? And, and leave the fishing to the experts. But they didn't. What Jesus began to ask Peter to do, basically, because we know this, we know this story, they, they, they uh, fished at night, not in the day. 
And so all of a sudden when he tells them to go out, and especially in the deep waters, this was contrary to everything that Peter knew about fishing. This went, went against everything he knew. Anybody got, how many fishers in there? Here. Right. Anybody fish? Okay. Kind of contrary. Would you, would you say this is kind of contrary to what you should do? Go out into deep waters in the middle of the day when it's hot, right? Because no, the, the fish don't come to the surface when it's hot. They stay low, right? I think, I don't know. I don't fish, so I'm just guessing. But everything, yeah, yeah, I am not a fisherman. But everything that was happening right now with Peter was counterculture. And sometimes when God grabs a hold of you and you truly are his child, the things he's calling you to do will feel counterculture. They, they will feel different. Peter could have thought he knew more than Jesus. Has anybody in your spiritual journey thought, I know more than Jesus? Why is it that we are filled in a church full of I did it my way things? Right? Think about this so much. I mean, this is... Peter could, say, Peter could say, I am the experienced fisherman here. Let me tell you what I think we should do based on my experience. I was looking at that, and God gave me a proverb, and it says this, a fool is in love with his own opinion. <laughs> a fool is in love with his own opinion, but wisdom means being teachable. Amen. So not only was, now, not only was this counterculture to Peter, but I think this is important for us to learn today. Lord, give us a teachable spirit. Yes. See, the thing is, something's happening today. You're either turning God off or you're turning God on. You're either turning the Holy Spirit off or you're turning the Holy Spirit on. You're either being teachable or you're not going to be teachable, right? Think about this. It's so important. So what did, do? What did Peter do? He obeyed. That is so important. Again, Obeying God in the little things. This is a challenge today. This is a challenge today. Obey God in the little things. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, by the way, circle that word, Master, we have toiled all night and we have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. At your word. I will let down the net. We must be obedient in small things and in great things, for the small things are as great as the great things. Do you know who wrote that? Derek Prince. Wasn't he the guy that, that in 1958 where that great revival broke out in prayer? I think it was. But he, he said, it's in the little things. And the great things. That things start to happen. So the key here was, was Peter's faith in the word of God. And being obedient <laughs> nevertheless at the word. At thy word. When Peter used the word master. He was actually saying something like <coughs> we were talking about last night. Jesus, I'm not the one with authority here. When I call you master, I'm not the one with authority here. You are the one with the authority. I love that. You are the one with authority. Authority. Peter was, was willing to submit to the authority of Jesus, even though he did not understand all that the Lord was doing. I, I love that song, Waymaker. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. <laughs> You never stop, you never stop working. Psalms 121, it says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. He doesn't slumber, he doesn't sleep. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. We may not understand, by the way, why things are the way they are, but God is calling us to take steps today. I truly believe that in everybody's journey, God is calling us to take steps today to trust Him. Do we trust Him? What's happening in our lives? What's going on in our relationships? Are we trusting Him? Are we taking these steps of obedience to follow Him? Think about that. Charles Spurgeon says this, God is too good to be unkind, and He is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace His hand, we must trust his heart. We all must, always must remember that God is a good God. Amen? 
And every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. That God is a good God. Turn to someone and say, God is a good God. He is a good God. So there's always a testing point for our soul. Will we surrender today? Will we say, Jesus, you can have command in my life? Because that's where it all begins. Think about this. You can be the, the captain of my soul, Lord. Peter, will you trust me when I say, let down your nets? Jesus has asked me this week, Curtis, will you trust me when I tell you to let down your nets? I've had to, I've had to ask myself this question all week long. This wasn't just for you. This was for me. Curtis, will you let down your nets? When I tell you, will you be obedient in the small steps? Will you be obedient in the big steps? Are you going to be obedient to me? Will you let your nets down when I tell you to? Will you trust me? And that's the question for us. Will we CCN? Will we trust Jesus when he says, let down our nets? When God says for us to let down our nets, are we going to be obedient and take those steps, whether they're small or large, to make sure that we're following him. So what does this mean? I, I, think, I think there's a few things I'd like to close with today. I think the first thing is that we need to realize that we need to be people who live by faith and not by fear. Amen? That's the reason why we actually sang that this morning. There's nothing left to fear. Because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. There's nothing left to fear. Think about that. Perfect love cast out all fear, right? Yes. There's no fear in that relationship of trusting him. If we truly know his character, if we know who God is, we can trust him when he asks us to step out in faith and not be afraid. John 14, 1 says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Jesus said, believe also in me. Yes. And so Jesus is calling us today to trust him. I truly believe there's, it's impossible for any of us to be here today to not have a place that we need to trust Jesus. Yes. I believe every single person in here is, is working this through. What, where are you calling me to trust you, God? I need to trust you. I need to trust you in, in this relationship. And, and one way to do this today is make room, by the way. If you really want to know the heart of God, if you want to live by faith, you've got to make room for prayer and worship. Amen? Yes. It can't be a Sunday thing. It can't be a Sunday thing. You've got to make room for prayer and and worship. And you know, next, next, this coming up Wednesday is actually Lent. Can you believe that? It's not the stuff on our clothes, by the way. It's not Lent. <laughs> it starts on the 22nd. And, and it goes up through Easter. It's actually like 40 days. And they, and they have this thing called prayer and fasting. Yeah. Prayer and fasting. And I truly believe that one of the things that God's calling us to do is take a breath from something. For me, that's what fasting is all about. For me, fasting is all about taking a breath from something and giving more time to God. Anybody need to give more time to God? Let me see your hands. All right, we do. If we were honest, we would say, so there's, all of us could do something every day. We could eliminate some Netflix or some social media thing out of our way, right? And make a little space for God. And so that's what I want to encourage you to do is that, remember, for us, Lent is not, going, is not a religious thing, by the way. It's a relational thing. We're not going to tell you what to do during Lent. We're going to ask you to pray about it, to seek His face, and allow yourself to make space for God more. Because I truly believe in 40 days that God is just going to blow your mind. He's going to take you into deep waters, and you're going to learn to trust Him in ways that you've never thought possible. See, I need, by the way, when I talk about uh, uh, getting away from social media, uh, Sometimes my information begins to form me. The things I'm hearing, it begins to form me. And I need to make sure that my spiritual formation is coming from the Word of God and not from the Word of the world. Amen? That's the reason why it says in Romans 12, 1, what? Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice Accept what God, which is your spiritual service, and do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. What? 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when I stay connected to God, when I stay connected to God's word, when I stay connected in God in prayer and worship, he becomes my calm and he becomes my peace in the midst of life's difficult situation that I can have be a person of faith, not fear. Amen? Yeah. I want to be a person of faith, not fear. Amen? Yeah. I want to be a person that says, when I'm so close to God, I'm living so close to the S-O-N son, that when he calls me to come out to deep waters, I just step. All the beautiful miracles in the Bible, think about the, the, the walls of Jericho came out because people walked around the walls for seven days and they shouted and walls came down. The Ark of the Covenant went before the people as they praised and waters were opened. Israel came out of it. I mean, a Red Sea was part. Giants come down. This is what happens when we truly have faith in God and we get close to his heart. I truly believe this. God's peace is a peace that goes beyond human comprehension. And this is what happens when we get close to God. I want you to fill this in. As we pour out our brokenness, He pours in His peace. Think about that today. Today, instead of having fear, we can have faith. As we pour out our brokenness, He pours in His peace. The second thing I think, we need to be people who live sacrificially, not selfishly. We live sacrificially, not selfishly. And this is, what, this is what I think we're having. The theme of homelessness and poverty as a condition of discipleship begins here. Homelessness and, homelessness and poverty, okay? It becomes kind of like a theme uh, of discipleship. Many will be called to leave all and follow Jesus. Amen? As a matter of fact, the mandate for us is every day is what? To pick up our cross, Right? To die, die ourselves and pick up our cross and follow him as Christians. That's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Anybody with me? Y'all with me? Yeah. You haven't turned me off yet? But this, this, is, this is what's happening is that many will be called to leave all and follow Jesus. His disciples in Luke 5.11 says, When they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything to follow him. This is what the disciples did. Amen? Actually, I think that that can happen to all of us today. I believe that as we gather here, we can scatter, and that can be the theme of heart. God, I'm going to leave all to follow you. Because it hasn't anything to do with, with money or home. It means it's just about our life, saying, I'm surrendered to you. I'm gonna, I, I want to follow you. His, his would-be disciples, all the people that, that were crowding in on him, in, in Luke 18, 22. Now, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And what does he say? Come and follow me. Can you imagine the call that day? The disciples were there. Follow me, leave everything. And he said to everybody, he said, come and follow me. The, the doors were wide open. The crowds, literally, in 1829 and 30. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brother or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. So there's this call to the disciples, to the would-be disciples, to the crowds. See, we live sacrificially, not selfishly. Amen? We have been blessed to be a blessing. Amen? Amen. Turn to someone and say, I've been blessed. I've been blessed to be a blessing. We are people of compassion. And the, and the best example of that, by the way, if you look at the early church in, in Acts 4, when the believers, I mean, after the day of Pentecost, and, and they were filled, they were living sacrificially. I mean, I mean, they were, they were given, it says that all the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. Wow, we're possessed of people, isn't, aren't we? Right? But think about what's happening here in the book of Acts. And there are examples of what we need to be as a church. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. I want to tell you thank you. Because to the best of, I believe my 
my understanding as your pastor. I've watched you do this over and over again. I celebrate this when, when I see our, our meal train happening. I celebrate when I see people taking meals to people and, and money being given to people to help in, in uh, rents and, and gas. I, I, I want, I'm thankful that we are a people that truly want to live like God is calling us to live, right? And even when we see people, by the way, which I don't know if you saw, but the homeless population of Coolidge is growing. Don't turn your nose up. Don't try to diagnose why they're where they're at. Because that will make you bitter. And it will give you a cause to reason to say something. And, and it says that if you don't have anything good to say, I, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this, don't say anything at all. But when you see those, those people that are struggling in life, we should have compassion. We should have compassion. Lord, help us to know how to help people that are hurting. Amen? Amen. Think about that. We are the body of Christ. We are compassionate. And I <coughs> truly believe that God is helping compassion to be a part of our core value. I believe that God is helping compassion to be our culture around here. Amen? Amen. That we are people of compassion. Mark 10, 45 says, it's this, where even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So, verse 6 and 7, instead of Peter claiming all the value will catch for himself, this is a beautiful picture, picture. Peter and Andrew called their partners to share in it. It says, and this time their nets were so full, amen. They let down their nets, amen. They were taking those steps. Now their nets are so full, they can't fill up their boats fast enough. And they realized that there's no, there's not a room. And so boats were filled. Now all the boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. Can you imagine, can you imagine out fishing and all of a sudden you have so many fish in your boat? This is a true story, by the way. This is a true story. And, and whenever I see about those fish in that boat, you know what I think about? God's grace. I, I, I see all these guys just like up to their knees in fish. You know? Think about it. Look at the thing about it. They're filled and they're overflowing. And that's what we are in. We're up to our knees in fish, aren't we? We are up to our knees and beyond in the grace of God. Think about the how God prayed. But this is what happened. So we are not, when he called everybody in, he says, we are not reservoirs, but channels of blessings to share with others what God has graciously given to us. So in verse 8 now, as we're coming to the end of this part of this beautiful miracle of God, once again providing uh, all of these fish as a testimony to who he is. And, and Peter's looking at all these fish and he saw, it says he fell down, he, he, but when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of this, the catch of fish which they had taken, and likewise also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Can you imagine the tremendous success of their efforts? And the obvious reason for their sudden success gave Peter this twofold vision. He said he saw the Lord, and he saw his power, and he saw his wisdom and knowledge, and then he saw and he saw his sinlessness, and then Peter saw himself a sinful creature. And as a sinful man, Peter's instincts were to say, get away from me, amen. Get away from me. Get away from me. Flee from the holy. And Peter's response functions as an example of sin in the presence of, of the holy. Peter's not an actively wicked individual. Rather, Peter is merely a normal man whose sense of moral failures overwhelms him. He's overwhelmed in the presence of the holy. And this experience, guess what? It produces conviction. Amen? A conviction of sin which made him uncomfortable in Christ's presence. And the first impulse of Peter was, depart. And one of the things I, I think Luke is pressing on us as readers is, be like Peter. It says in Romans 5.8, 
But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. See, Peter always spoke his first impulse, but Jesus knew that his deeper wish was salvation from sin. Is that our desire today? We really don't want to push Jesus away. We truly desire salvation, amen, from our sins. And I think that is so important as we, this last part, let us be people who live and shine the light. We do not hide it. In Luke 5, 10 and 11, it says, And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, for now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. Steps of faith. Little steps of faith. Decisions that we make today can bring great breakthrough. When you look at Peter's life, you see that over and over again. As he made these little steps of faith, as he, as he listened to the Savior, as he listened to God speak to him, and as he said yes and was obedient, great breakthroughs happen. And are we wondering sometimes why we aren't sometimes experiencing those in our own personal journey? The question is, could we possibly go and ask the Lord, hey, Lord, were there some steps of obedience that you called me to take that I said no to? Are there some places in my life that, that you called me out upon the water to deeper waters? You were calling me, but yet I said no, not this time, not at this point. Maybe the best thing for us to do, I think, in this whole idea of, 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 taking, uh, of taking small steps is just to, to do, is to come to Jesus this morning. Uh, we're going to, if, if you've got your communion, I want you to get your communion out right now. And I'm going to ask Bo and, and, and Katie to come up and um, they're going to sing a, a, a song. It's called Abide. Everything in this story we see Jesus just drawing Peter closer and closer. And Jesus knew that Peter would deny him. Jesus knew the disciples would be scattered. And guess what, by the way? You don't want to miss this point. Jesus knew you. And he knew where you would struggle. And he knew where you would hurt. And in all of that, he still draws close to us. He will never push us away. We might be like Peter. We may try to push and flee from Jesus, but Jesus will never push us away. He will be there 24-7. Whether you love him or not, he loves you. See, the cross, the cross that we're going to, communion and cross that we're going to have today is the truth of what Jesus has done for us. The truth of it is, is that he went to the cross, he knew that we would reject him, and even today there are things in our lives where we could be rejecting him, and still, if you asked him what would he do, he would say, I would do it all over again. I will go every time to the cross and die for your sins, that's how much I love you. That's how much forgiveness Jesus has for us today. I think as we looked at Peter's life, Everything gave him an opportunity to just get closer and closer to Jesus. So as we get our hearts ready, what, what are those steps that maybe you need to take today? Maybe as we sing this song, make this time a time with you and Jesus. Don't just sit idly. Give him thanks. Make a commitment to him today. Take a step of faith. Whatever God is calling you to do, the Holy Spirit is here. Amen. He's here. He's here. And He's talking with us. 
So respond and let God have his way in your life.
We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. Nobody has ever loved us like you, Father. That you would come and die a brutal death, be nailed to a cross so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be clothed in your righteousness, Lord. And just, I am clothed in your righteousness. The truth of that just is so powerful, God. You took on all of my sin and you gave me all of your righteousness, Lord. You forgave me, Father, of the cross. We can't give you enough thanks and praise, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, that when we think about you this week, Lord, and your sacrifice for us and the steps that you took, Father, the fact that you left eternity and you came in the form of man and you lived and dwelt among us and you showed us how to live and walk and trust, Lord. And Father, I pray that this, this week, God, that as we see the opportunities, Lord, that are before us, Lord, that we will be willing, Father, to take those steps of faith. As we gather this morning and as we get ready to scatter into our world, Father, may we not forget your love and your goodness and that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you will go with us, Lord. Thank you, God, that you are already doing miracles in people's hearts and lives today, Lord. I know, God, you're working. I can see your hand, Father, your gracious hand, Father, in such a mighty way, Lord. Lord, we love you, Father, so very much, Lord. Help us to be obedient, Father, in the small things. Help us to be obedient, Father, in the great things, Lord. Help us to, to be people that truly trust you, Father, that, that take steps of faith and that we honor you with our lives. Lord, there's a whole world that's outside these doors, Lord, and if we can just be that light, God, that you've called us to be, Father. If we can live by faith and, and, and not by fear, if we can live sacrificially, Lord, not selfishly, Lord, what you will do through us, Lord, for your glory, and for your glory only, God. We give you praise and we give you thanks, Lord. We love you, Jesus, and we know you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. God bless you. Again, I want to encourage you tonight at 4 o'clock for prayer time. I hope you're getting ready to take some steps because you're going to have a breakthrough. Amen. Don't forget our giving box for offerings is back there in the back. Have a great week and uh, God bless you. Oh, thank you. Word of Bobby.